प्लीज सिट डाउन कंफर्टेबली विथ योर हैंड्स ऑन योर नीज इन ज्ञान और चिन्ह मुद्रा योर हेड नेक शोल्डर्स बैक ऑल इन अ स्ट्रेट लाइन आईज एंड माउथ जेंटली क्लोज become aware of the whole body from the top of your head to your toes awareness of the body posture and the muscular tone in the different parts of the body shift your awareness to your breath spontaneous natural breath coupled with awareness shift your awareness to your eyebrow center bhrumadhya and at the bhrumadhya try to visualize the image of either your guru or your ishta devata if you have one or of a brightly burning your flame and if you are unable to visualize you can also become aware of a subtle pulsation at this point maintaining your awareness on this experience we shall chant the mantra om three times together followed by the shanti mantras taking in a deep breath तमस्तु ओम शांति 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 हरि ओम हरि ओम तत्सत जेंटली रब द पाम्स अगेंस्ट इच अदर प्लेस देम ऑन द क्लोज्ड आईज experience the warmth radiating from the palms to your eyes to the brain to the whole body then gently move the palms away and open your eyes hari om tat sat namo narayan jai ho today we are going to discuss on a very important point about handling conflicts and crisis and as we think about this i would two stories come to my mind one is a story of a young prince who is caught in a conflict he is a prince 
he adores his father and his father is killed by none other than his uncle the prince's uncle the father's the king's brother and this king new king now marries the mother of this prince the prince on one hand is burning with a desire for revenge to avenge the death of his father and on the other hand is torn in the conflict should i or should i not kill the new king who is after all the king who is also his uncle and who is now also the husband of his widowed mother and this goes on and in the end the question comes to the mind the famous question to be or not to be hey that is the question prince hamlet depicted by the legendary shakespeare speaks of the conflicts and how one could respond to the conflicts and all of us know how that story ended but there is another story the other story is again of a prince this prince has four more brothers and they have been wronged by their cousins right from birth the cousins are plotting scheming devious many times these cousins have tried to kill these young princes five of them things go on the rivalry grows bitter enmity ensues and a do or die war is scheduled this prince in question has struggled has worked hard for this one moment to be able to kill these scheming cousins of his who have disturbed their lives i speak of arjuna and at that crucial moment when both the armies were face to face in battle at that moment arjun gets a nervous breakdown a crisis <clears throat> to fight or not to fight becomes his question and in his dilemma he quotes multiple scriptures multiple points of views why i should not fight at the same time he has this burning desire to fight to avenge the mistakes which the kauravas have done not only personal but also on a higher level and he goes into nervous breakdown and to a legendary warrior considered to be the best archer of his times to be able to to not to be able to go into war when is most crucial that is worse than death but that is what arjuna is contemplating he is again faced by this conflict to fight or not to fight if i have fight i see my gurus my teachers 
my grandfathers, my great grandfathers, my uncles, my cousins, my all my relatives who are standing in front of me. What will I achieve by killing them? Mind you, this is by a person who is not getting cold field because he is afraid of the great power which he is facing. He has defeated this army earlier. Single-handedly. When he was Brihannala, it was this same army which had come. And this army was vanquished single-handedly by Arjuna. So it was not his strength which was in question, but it was his mind. Because he knew that this time, it's a point of no return. He has to kill them all. And his mind could not comprehend it. He was caught in this dilemma. Should I or shouldn't I? He goes to the extent that it is better if I just walk away and live as a beggar rather than killing all these people. These are so noble people. These are my relatives. And killing all of them is going to destroy the society because this war is not going to be a small war, which history did prove was not a small war. The consequences of that war are still being borne by the civilization of the Vedic Sabhyata. And therein, I believe, lies the crucial difference. Hamlet did not have a friend, a philosopher, a guide. So when he was caught in this dilemma, to be or not to be, he did not have anybody to turn to. Yeah, he had friends, but nobody from a higher source of wisdom. And so he could not actually resolve his issue. The dilemma continued and we all know what the end was. Death. But on the other hand, what happened to Arjuna? Arjuna had the great fortune to have none other than Yogeshwar Krishna. I use the word Yogeshwar. Krishna is one of the highest proponents of yoga. He is the one who has understood yoga in its subtlety, in its magnanimity, in all its concepts and he has lived yoga. And such was the person who was entrusted to take the chariot of Arjuna. And how could Krishna let his best friend go down a path which is of no use. So, what did Krishna do? Did Krishna try to boost him and tell him, oh look, these are the people who have done so much wrong to you. Oh look, this is the person who has insulted your wife. This is the person who has insulted your mother. This is the person who has tried to kill you. Did he, Krishna, try and bring out this feeling of revenge? No. Krishna starts with something totally different. You are speaking of things which shouldn't even be spoken, especially by great people like you, O Arjun. And still, you prattle as if you are speaking words of wisdom. And then Krishna starts with a totally different context. He speaks of the immortal soul. And then from the immortal soul, the highest philosophy, 
he starts bringing it down step by step into real life. The text which ensues is world famous, the Srimad Bhagavad Gita. Nobody needs any introduction to that. Gurudev Swami Satyananji always used to call the Bhagavad Gita as the blueprint of life. How should one live when confronted with difficulties, with almost impossible dilemmas? I am caught between the devil and the deep sea, so to say. So what is my way out? And then Krishna keeps on explaining all the chapters, different perspectives, different angles. He does not for a moment speak of revenge. He does not for a moment speak of retribution. But he speaks of dharma. Dharma is not religion. Dharma is that which holds you together. And what does, what is it that holds you together? It is the essence of being you. What is that essence? That essence is your inherent quality which you are duty bound to follow. Water is duty bound to moisten, wetten the surface it touches. Fire is duty bound to burn. So if fire burns, why should it feel sad? If water drowns, why should it feel sad? It is doing its dharma. And Bhagwan Krishna continues explaining different aspects. He brings in the highest levels of philosophy from the Vedanta. The Bhagavad Gita can be considered as the extract of the entire Vedantic literature. But, mind you, this extract did not take place in a cozy armchair with the fire besides you and a nice cup of coffee with you, with you. No, it was on the battlefield. And we also are in such a battlefield all the time. The Kauravas and the Pandavas are within us. We can identify with Duryodhana at different points of time. We can identify with Dushasana that thought process, the thought process of Shakuni, the thought process of all of them. When we want to take shortcuts, when we want our desires, in spite of knowing they are not to be correct. And then, on the other hand, we also are torn. No, this is not my duty. My duty is something different. I ought to do something different. And then we get confused. The same way as Arjun was confused. So much so that he gave up the bow and arrow and he told adamantly, I am not going to fight. Krishna explains Actually, he does not even explain. He reminds. Because this knowledge is within each and every one of us. The only thing is that we have forgotten about it. He reminds Arjuna about the glory of the Atma. He reminds Arjuna that transiting from one life into another is like Changing of dress. The Atma is Amar. Invincible. Cannot be destroyed. It is the body which is destroyed. And he goes on to explain what are the duties which bound every person. He explains the knowledge which needs to be understood. And having done all of that, in the end, 
Arjuna is told, Oh dear Arjun, I have now explained to you the entire context. I have given you the correct perspective. You were looking at something from a small tube hole. I have removed the tube hole and given you the broad perspective. Now it is for you to decide. Krishna did not tell him that now you go and fight. Krishna in the end tells him, it's your choice. What you want to do? Because Bhagavan Krishna enlightens Arjun. He removes the cobwebs, the conflicts in his mind. And then Arjun realizes it was his duty as a Kshatriya to stand against something which is unjust. And if it has got a great personal sacrifice required, so be it. He goes ahead. Sacrifices everything. For what? For the sake of dharma. For the sake of that knowledge. That is the difference between the two. One philosophy which thinks and lives only in the body in our present at a very small perspective. I am born. I grow. I enjoy. I want. I achieve. I don't achieve. I fight. I win. I lose. I am able to defend myself. I am unable to defend myself. I have emotional issues, I have successes, I have failures, I can't stand it, kill myself. This is the philosophy which comes from looking at four elements, Prithvi, Jal, Agni and Akasha. Yes. These are the four elements, earth, water, fire and air. These are the four elements which can be perceived by the senses. Akasha, the fifth, cannot be perceived by the senses. But there is something higher and greater than what is being perceived. That is what we need to understand. That is what Vedanta tells us. Vedanta tells us, Dear friend, you are not this body. I am not this body. I am not this mind. I am not these senses. Immortal self am I. This is the crucial difference. There is a continuity across what we consider as our entire life. What we consider as our entire life is perhaps just one chapter in a book. I might forget the previous chapters, but there is somebody who keeps note of all. When we connect to this principle, then a different understanding develops. And when we develop that understanding, then like the famed story of misconceptions between the uh, rope and the snake. I look at a snake, it is dim light and I'm convinced it's a snake. And I panic. I react. Somebody puts a torch and shows me, hey, it's just a piece of rope. You are just imagining things. I have misread the situation. How can I get 
a better perspective i get a perspective when the light is shown and this shining of the light is the knowledge of the self that i am greater than this body i am greater than this mind there is some subtle principle which is there within me this body that principle continues to live beyond this body and when this knowledge comes in our perspective changes our decisions change but it is very difficult for us to perceive these given our limitations and even if at points of time we are able to perceive this we are not able to implement those points how then can we implement them how can we upgrade ourselves so that we can know better about ourselves that is where yoga comes in yoga and vedanta are two sides of the same coin nowhere in the vedantic literature will you find exact details what has to be done it will tell you do this and it will happen but how you can't understand our minds are too gross to be able to make our minds subtle we need a tool that is where yoga comes in swami satyanand ji used to say often that that is the reason why yoga has the origin in tantra because tantra means technique rasayan tantra vigyan tantra tantra means a technique specified special technique if i want to make zinc from zinc ore there is a very specific technique which has to be applied no two things about it in the same way if i want to distill my knowledge my experience of this body of this mind of this senses and get a better perspective then i need some specific tools yoga provides us these tools yoga is a practice yoga is also a way of life because as we start practicing slowly and slowly our entire perspective changes and we have to begin with the first step there is an old ancient indian proverb says the journey of 1000 miles begins with the first step and proceeds one step at a time it doesn't proceed with leaps and bounds no it proceeds one step at a time and when you have perfected this one step at a time then perhaps you might have larger steps but that's for later where we are now at this point where i have got conflicts i have no understanding of situations i have difficulty understanding it is here that yoga provides us the tool because it is only the mind which perceives there is a principle of intelligence inside us and this principle of intelligence cognition cognates only that which is sent to 
this principle and this bringing in happens by the senses and the senses are in the purview of the mind the intellect is in the purview of the mind the emotions are in the purview of the mind depending on the quality of the mind we are able to perceive things if the mind is weak or weakened we perceive things differently and if the mind is strong we perceive it differently something which appears to be dead end finito actually might just be an opportunity to discover that oh there is another door which is quietly being opened it is said that when you reach a dead end and you see that the opponent is right behind you and you see there is no way out in desperation you flail your hands and suddenly you see oh there are some wings which are sprouting behind till this time you had no concept why these wings were coming but as you come to this dead end suddenly you can make out oh these wings i can make use of these wings these flaps which are there which were of no use which were just you know coming in the way how i can use them how can i train my mind to make use of these opportunities how can i train my mind to make use of the difficulties and turn them into opportunities that is where yoga comes in because yoga is nothing but the science of mind management it does not oppose the mind gurudev swami satyananda used to say that the mind is like a very powerful elephant you cannot oppose it confront it it will just throw you away it will smash you to pieces but you can befriend the elephant and befriending the elephant you can tame the elephant and then this elephant because it is befriended does everything for you we have examples of this we know in today's times of course we don't use elephants but 50 80 100 years ago elephants were in use and they when trained could do the job of 100 people that is the strength of the mind and this mind cannot be trifled with it needs to be dealt with great care that is what yoga teaches us how to befriend the mind how to gradually tame the mind how to harness the abilities of the mind and then get what you want to be done but when you want something to be done how do you know is it the correct thing for that you need a higher discrimination and better wisdom again this is where yoga comes in because it allows you to upgrade your self much like in story of arjuna arjuna had blinkers over him so he could only see this and he perceived oh if i am killing my guru if i am killing my teacher if i am killing my uncles i am going to get you know the i will be become a sinner however slowly one by one by one layers were removed and ability to perceive brought in for arjuna 
it could happen because he had spent a lifetime practicing yoga. For us, we need to start. And where can we start? We can start with simple practices. Practice of asan, practice of pranayam, practice of premeditative states or dhyahar practices. These are practices which tell us that, oh, there is something more. Those who have been practicing, they know over a period of time that there is a difference. These are not gymnastics practices. These are not body contortions. There is something different. Many of us don't know what different it is, but there is something different. There is a different energy which comes in. And slowly and slowly over a period of time, we are able to make out and harness. It is not an easy path, but it is a very fulfilling path. Because when I have the ability to scale mountains and I'm just sitting crying that I can't get up a tree, I might not know that, but somewhere in our unconscious mind, this information that I have the ability to scale mountains is present. And when at that point, that inner I sees that this outer I is crying because it cannot climb a tree, there is sorrow. There is dissatisfaction. And no matter what you do, you say, oh, this tree is not worth climbing and you give 101 excuses. Doesn't work. You can, you can tell that to others. You could convince. If you have a good uh, command over language, you can convince everybody else. But you can't con convince yourself. You can't run away from yourself. In your heart of hearts, you know and that causes dissatisfaction. That causes conflicts. That causes difficulties. And this gives rise to crisis. The only way to handle crisis is to recognize it and then start making, taking baby steps towards the correction. And we will see that once we start taking those steps, there is help which comes from different dimensions. All we need to do is to take the first step and be resolute. And help comes from different dimensions. So, this is how we need to approach our problems in life. We might not be great scholars. We might not know Sanskrit. We might not know the Vedas. We might not even know the Vedantas, the philosophy. But if we know this and we have begun our steps through the yogic philosophy, we have started making progress. On the other hand, if we have the complete knowledge, every shloka of the Vedas, of all the Upanishads, I have it by heart. But I have not brought it into my practice. It's of no use. It's just like a donkey who's carrying all the books of the knowledge of the world. It doesn't make the donkey a wise person. It just makes the donkey a carrier of knowledge, not the beholder of knowledge. That is what we need to do. And towards this end, we must realize that every conflict, every crisis comes with an opportunity to turn towards this direction. All we need to do is step back a bit, pause and take stock. We will observe that we don't need information from outside. Information exists in here. It's only we 
who shut our ears, refuse to listen. The moment we step back and we start re-evaluating options, come up. That is how we can become Arjuna, not let. Difficulties in life are diff indeed very overwhelming. And they should be overwhelming. Because if there were no difficulties, there is no growth. But to grow, you need proper nourishment. Proper and prolonged nourishment. So, Swamiji always used to consider this. There is no point in speaking about Rasagolla and writing an entire PhD thesis on Rasagolla. Better, you just eat a rasgulla and you know everything about it. So, Vedanta, Yoga are practical sciences. Does not matter if you find this whole philosophy very overwhelming. It's not needed to really know the details of it. All we need to know is, yes, there is a system by which I can harness the strength of my mind. And the strength of my mind is infinite. Forget the Atma that is way beyond our capabilities. Let us first try and befriend the mind. And when we start doing it, then you will see that every moment there is joy, there is happiness, there is great sense of satisfaction and there is a great conviction that yes, I am doing what is correct. So, that is what I feel we need to realize. I would like to conclude here. If there are any questions, we can take the questions. But before that, I would like you to have a short practice. We were, being, we were speaking of theory and practice. What point is it if we don't do a practice? Swami Shivanandji used to say, an ounce of practice is greater than a ton of theory. We have spent a lot of time theorizing, understanding, which is also essential because our minds are intellectualized now. But let us also have a short practice. Please sit in any comfortable posture. Eyes gently closed. Hands on your knees in Jnana or Chin Mudra. Awareness of the body. Its posture, the muscular tone. Awareness of the different body parts. Awareness of your head, the posture, the muscular tone, the relative position, everything about the head. Then move to your neck. Analyze everything about the neck. Move to your shoulders. Observe the shoulders. Your both arms. Your chest. Your upper back. Abdomen. Lower back, 
hips, both the legs, the whole body. With your eyes closed, become aware that we receive impulses through five modalities and try to become aware of these five modalities. The modality of touch, of taste, of smell, of hearing, of vision. Just become aware of the sense organs of each of these sensations. The skin, the tongue, the nose, the ears, the eyes. Let us bring our awareness to the sensation of touch. Become aware of the different touch sensations which you are able to perceive. Observe each sensation, analyze it, and then move on. Pick up another sensation, touch sensation. You are aware of the pressure and the contact between the body and your seat. You are aware of the contact points between the body and other body parts. You are aware of the contact points between the body and the clothes. You are aware of the contact point between the body, the skin, and the breeze. Spend some time becoming aware of each of this body part, the sensation, and maintain your awareness of you sitting comfortably. And now drop the awareness of the touch and become aware of the sensation of sound. Bring your awareness to your ears. I am able to hear different sounds. Some are near me. Some are further apart, some are stationary, some are moving, some are due to a living being, some are due to a machine. As we hear a sound, there is an instant perception, understanding which develops. Become aware of this entire process. Pick up one sound. Observe it to its entirety. Understand it fully. And then drop that sound. Pick up another sound. Continue this for a few moments.
become aware that some sounds have got also an emotional component. Some sounds have got a thought component. When you hear a sound, some emotion springs up. When you hear another sound, a thought springs up unbidden. Become aware of this. I hear a sound and an emotion has sprung up. I hear a sound and a thought has come up. I hear a sound and an image has sprung up. Become aware of this process. Continue to identify a sound, observe it, dissect it, analyze it, and then move on. Now, try to become aware of all the sounds simultaneously. Let your ears become like powerful radars. Any sound, soft or harsh, stationary or moving, close or far, is immediately picked up and you are aware of all the sounds simultaneously. Let there be no sound which is missed. And then drop the sounds, drop the awareness of the sounds and bring your awareness to the sound of the movement of the breath. Become aware of the sound of your breath. As I breathe in, as I breathe out, there is a subtle sound generated within us. Become aware of this sound. Deepen your awareness and become aware that as you breathe in, there is a slightly higher pitched sound. And as you breathe out, the sound is of a lower pitch. I breathe in, I breathe out. I breathe in, I breathe out. Include now a visualization of a thin silver tube extending from your navel to the base of your throat. Imagine a thin tube and imagine that the breath as you breathe in is moving up from the navel to the throat across the heart and as you breathe out it moves down from the throat across the heart once again to the navel. Try to remain aware of the sounds of the heart's breath and as you breathe in, you are aware that the breath moves up from the navel, heart, throat 
and as you breathe out a lower pitch sound throat or navel navel or throat throat or navel manipur anahat vishuddhi vishuddhi anahat manipur manipur anahat vishuddhi vishuddhi anahat manipur breathing in manipur anahat vishuddhi breathing out vishuddhi anahat manipur breathing in navel or throat breathing out throat or navel visualize and experience that there are small particles of light of high energy which are also moving up and down navel or throat throat or navel navel or throat throat or navel and as the light moves up and down up and down it is generating a very powerful yet subtle energy gently release the awareness of the movement of the breath let this tube dissolve and the energy which has been generated is diffusing into the whole body the whole body is a wash with this energy awareness of your body once again the posture the muscular tone different parts of the body awareness of the touch sensation and the contact points between the floor or the chair in the body between the clothes and the body the breeze in the body different scratch sensations any touch sensation externalize your awareness further become aware of the sounds within the room externalize your awareness even further and become aware of the sounds circumstances and situations outside the room and when you have externalized your awareness completely then gently move the fingers wiggle your toes slightly roll the neck from side to side clasp the fingers stretch your hands over your head give your body a good stretch bring the hands down and gently open your eyes are you sat right this is a short practice of knowing the senses and a short modification by which we can improve the energetics of the person and it is with such practices that we can gradually start working towards befriending the mind harnessing the mind strengthening the mind and a day comes when the same mind can do all those things which we feel are impossible with this let us conclude today's topic if you have any doubts any questions we can spend few minutes over 
you can put your questions in the chat box or you can unmute yourself and ask. Hello. Namo Rain Swamiji Chetna. Uh, Swamiji, I had a, um, actually a clarification and a question. Uh, you just mentioned that um, um, that yoga is one of the tools by which we can, um, as you mentioned in, through this practice session also, that we can befriend our mind and be more aware of um, I would say ourselves so that we are able to uh, maybe behave correctly or uh, use the principles that we are learning to be able to deal with a conflicted situation. Mm -hmm. So if uh, since meditation is one of the tools and it will with regular practice only we can become more aware and uh, deal with the situation. Uh, is there something that we can do on a daily basis, Swamiji, to, to kind of, um, you know, deal with the day-to-day -day situations uh, by which I mean, like, for example, sometimes we get uh, irritated with, uh, with a certain situation and we, whilst we know it's not right for us to maybe take it out on somebody else, but we tend to, you know, get irritated with somebody else or show our displeasure or show that anger in that burst of moment which we feel bad later on. So would it only be through meditation, Swamiji, that we can maybe control this? No. <clears throat> if I want to have good nutrition and I keep having only proteins, no matter how good proteins are, that's not going to be healthy. For me. In the same manner, we need to have different components, yogic components to be integrated in our life. A little bit of asana, a little bit of a pranayam, a little bit of meditative practices, a little bit of bhakti, a little bit of jnana, a little bit of karma, or rather I must say a lot of karma. Karma yoga, not karma. So when we gradually start inculcating these different components in our life, see over a period of time we will be able to handle ourselves better. I cannot say that the situation will go wrong but we can handle ourselves better and turn the situation into beneficial. Sri Ram he was going to be the crown prince and that moment he was banished thrown into the jungles. But he turned it round, used that hardship, converted into an opportunity, became immortal. This is possible to yoga. Not on such big scales, but everyday scales, as you very rightly mentioned. I get angry, I lose my temper, and then I repent in leisure. How can I change? To do that, if we start with some asana practices, when I say asana practices, I don't mean physical practices. Asana is much more than just a physical practice. There are multiple components in it. Of course, this is not the platform to discuss details about that. You can contact an uh, expert yoga teacher. A bit of asanas, bit of pranayam, bit of meditative practices together, slowly start making this difference. And a day comes when we can handle ourselves better. We don't get angry by the same things as we used to get earlier. We are able to convert this anger into something useful. We don't become vegetables, but we become something useful. Thank you, Swamiji. So basically, daily practicing of what we are learning uh, is, is, is the way to go. It cannot be done as a shortcut method. No, no shortcuts. You have to have, but if it is, uh, if we are starting off and if daily practice is difficult, 
then we can even start with three times a week. Whatever it be the sankal, we can start once a week. And then we start, we gradually increase it so that it becomes a part of life. And then when it becomes a part of life, it automatically becomes daily too, 24 7. So gradually. Right. right. Slow and steady. Slow and steady. No, I just wanted to know this breathing that we do from the abdomen to the throat, or rather, money put to issue the What is the exact effect of that? You see, there are subtle psychic passages which are present within us and we are not aware about them. In the beginning, we have just to imagine that. But through those imagination, there is a subtle activation of these passages. And activation of these passages generates energy. And this energy slowly starts changing our perceptions, our strengths, our ability to respond. So the effect of this is basically to trigger appropriate energy patterns, which can heal, which can uplift, and in the end, transform. So please sit comfortably. We shall chant Shanti part to conclude. Eyes gently closed. Hands on your knees. Nyan or Chin Mudra. Awareness at the eyebrow center. Maintaining your awareness at the eyebrow center. Bring in the same image you had chosen in the beginning of the session. Keeping your awareness on this experience, we shall chant the mantra Om three times, followed by the Shanti part. Taking in a deep breath. Asato ma sadgamaya, tamaso ma jyotir gamaya, mrityor ma mrutam gamaya, sarvesham swasti bhavatu, sarvesham shantir bhavatu, sarvesham purnam bhavatu, sarvesham mangalam bhavatu. Loka samasta sukhino bhavantu Om trambakam yajamahe sugandhim pushti vardhanam urvarukam ivabandhanam nutyor mukshiyam amratat Om shanti 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 Hands in Pranam Mudra. Tvameva Mata Chapita Tvameva Tvameva Bandhusha Sakha Tvameva Tvameva Vidya Dravinam Tvameva Tvameva Sarvam Mama Deva Deva Tvameva Sarvam Mama Deva Deva Vameva Sarvam Mama Deva Deva Hari Om. Gently rub your palms against each other. Place them over the closed eyes. Experience the warmth radiating from the palms to your eyes. 
relaxing the eyes, relaxing the brain, relaxing the whole body. And then gently move the palms away, open your eyes. Hari Om, Sat, Namo Narayan, Jai Ho.